want to get us started off and tell them what I forced you to read in the last week? <laughs> I, this is 100% your fault. Uh, I, I really quick before we start, I just I, I have to address this to two people. They may not even be on, but to Kathy Crandall and Mark Hardwick, I would like you to look and see that this shirt has zero checks on it. No checks on this shirt. Solid color. You'll thank me later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's get started on this. I, th I think there's there's a couple things that we should do to preface this first. Um, we had a fantastic time last week doing the the start of our champions tour um and and sharing with you i think you know areas of of daryl's life and my life that are really really important and really just tragically if i could communicate with all of you guys with with sort of cheesy sports cliches i would probably do that but i know i would lose 88 percent of the audience out there um what we've tried to do uh this time around is is we have invested some time in reading uh, a book from an author that we have, we both respect, think is, is very insightful. Um, and the idea is to help kind of share some of what we've taken from this book with you, with the hope that this will impact you positively in the things that you do in your business and your personal life. Um, the author of this book, uh, Upstream, is a, a guy named Dan Heath. Uh, he and his brother have put out several books. Um, one of the ones that, that stuck out to us, and I highly recommend this if you get the chance, uh, Power of Moments. This will plus your customer service to such a high degree. I, I just think if, if you have ever wondered how you could get to a point where your business could take that next step. If you read Power of Moments, it is almost a, a blueprint and a roadmap of how to do it. Um, for us, uh, Upstream was really, really interesting, and I think it's incredibly relevant to where we're at right now. And the idea behind this book is really how to prevent problems before they happen. Uh, and this is, and phew, it almost sounds like a superpower, right? How do I prevent problems before they happen? But really, the premise is, is that we are all so busy and we are so reactive to the problems that happen to us that we spend most of our days either seeing a problem and solving it, uh, a fire starts, we put it out, that we spend this a massive amount of time in reactive mode. And the hard part about that is we actually feel really productive at the end of the day. We can solve problems all day, put out fires all day, and feel really, really good about ourselves and the near-term impact that we have had because of it. Unfortunately, we spend so much time in that reactive mode, we may be missing the fact that we could be preventing these problems down upstream. We could be getting to a point that those problems that we interact with every single day possibly could go away. Um, I think some of the things to look at here as we go through, and we will talk about upstream thinking and downstream thinking, uh, one is not necessarily better than the other, it's a perspective component. Uh, downstream thinking is very much near term, how we handle situations that are right in front of us, and those are valid. Uh, upstream thinking is, how do I get to the root of any problem to make sure that that problem doesn't come down to us? I will, I think, because I, I think stories are the best way to go with a lot of this. Um, I think there are a few areas that, that we should touch on specifically in this book as to how we end up focusing more in a downstream environment than we do in an upstream environment. And really there's, there's, there's three areas that prevent us. And we'll, we'll talk about these in detail, but one of them is problem blindness. And we'll get to that. One of them is ownership. And the third is tunneling. And we will actually talk through these as we go. Um, but I wanted to give one really quick example to kind of kick this thing off and actually show how all three of these components came into play in a huge business that was losing a ton of money at the same time making a ton of money. Um, everybody's heard of Expedia. Expedia is a, spa, a spot that we go to to book all of our travel. There are some that would argue that it was Expedia that disintermediated the travel agent, right? They were allowing customers to come online, book their travel to anywhere in the world, uh, and do it all with, with you know, price comparisons and shopping tools that allowed you to do this from the convenience of your own home without going and interacting with the travel agent or anybody else. As Expedia grew, they were also massively focused on their level of customer service. So they made sure that they had a, a call center, a customer service center that was also really, really robust 
They were graded and ranked on how well they solved the consumer's problem. Um, and they were receiving about 20 million calls a year at $5 a call. So they were spending about $100 million servicing their clients. And in around 2012, uh, their head of customer service took a look and said, I, I don't understand. We keep hiring more and more customer service people. There seem to be a really, really high success rate in solving the consumer's issues. But we're spending $100 million a year. What's going on? So at some point, they started looking at the data. And what they realized is that for every 100 customers that visited the site, 58 of them ended up calling the call center. And they're like, this is outrageous, right? How, how is over half the amount of people going to our site ending up calling this call center with some issues? Nobody had looked into this, but when you booked your flight, when you booked your travel plans, the way it was set up is you never got an itinerary sent to you. It was all done online on the screen right there. And when you closed out and you not taking good notes, that itinerary wasn't sent to you. So like most of us, within a couple of days, you go, I can't remember the exact time we're leaving. And they would call in just to get the itinerary. As soon as they fixed this problem, their calls went from 58 out of 100 to 15. The three examples there, one, ownership. Nobody had stood up to say, why are we getting so many calls? What is the issue around this? The problem blindness. We're doing a really, really robust business and we're super focused on customer service. Everything is going great. We don't have any issues. And the last one was tunneling. They created such a busy environment, nobody had taken the step back to say, are we really handling all the problems that we should be or have we created more problems than we need to? The whole premise behind this book and how I think it will both impact us personally and professionally is it's being able to remove yourself from the day-to-day -day activities that we all deem productive and make sure that we're not on that hamster wheel, that we're just running around and around and feeling productive but actually not getting anywhere. Um, I think the, the, the biggest takeaway in all of this is creating enough white space in your life to start thinking upstream. The hardest part with a downstream process and an upstream process is your downstream process, which is very reactive, happens without a lot of thought, right? You solve issues right on the fly. You try to get things handled. You bring in some people. You, you try to get that handled. Upstream, it's harder, right? It is one of those, those areas where upstream thinkers often don't get the kudos. A really good example would be a firefighter that runs into a burning building and saves someone is absolutely considered a hero and should be, right? That was downstream thinking, but absolutely necessary. We needed somebody there, that person needed help, the firefighter did it. The person who doesn't get any kudos is who's the one who developed the internal sprinkler system? The really tough part about that is you can't even quantify how many lives that person saved. So not only was the upstream thinker going above and beyond what was necessary, he'll never be recognized as a hero and will never know quantifiably how many lives he saved because of it. That's the hardest part with upstream thinking is it's often a voluntary action. It often comes without immediate impact and often it's very hard to measure, but you look back on it and you go, oh, thank God. You know, the seatbelt is another one. There was a really interesting statistic that came out that in the time period of the Vietnam War, we actually lost more people in car accidents than we did soldiers during that entire time of the Vietnam War. But we were focusing really myopically on that war because it was incredibly impactful. It felt like it was happening near to home, but we had actually totally lost sight of things that were preventable right in front of us in our own backyard. Um, as we go through this, the one hope that I have for everybody as, as we talk through this is that you can look directly into the things that you do every day. And we'll try to give some more examples of this. And taking this time where we may have a little more space than we've had before, we may have a little bit more slack in our schedule than we've had before. And we all start thinking upstream. We all start thinking, hey, am I handling the problems in both my personal and professional life that are impacting me now? Or am I doing things that can, I can impact for next year, five years, 10 years down the road? Daryl, do you want to talk about why you like the book? Yeah. So, um, you know, as Matt said, Chip and Dan Heath are authors that we've read before. I actually belong to like a, um, an email, uh, group of his that sends stuff out. And it was several months ago 
he was, I saw him that he does like a podcast and he was telling this story and, and it's just another way to, to talk about upstream, but he was telling the story of imagine that you're, you're sitting in a river and all of a sudden you see a kid, young kid floating down the river drowning. And so you jump in, you save the kid. And, and as you start to save the kid, you notice another kid is coming down the river. And so you jump back in again, you grab that kid, you bring him to the shore. And right when you bring that kid to the shore, you turn around, there's another one going. And so then the guy next to you jumps into the water with you. And he starts And over time, there's five, six kids coming down this river and you're just back and forth. You're saving them. You're bringing them to shore and you're back and forth and back and forth. And then he says, but then one guy stops and he gets out of the water and he starts running upstream. And you think you're being abandoned. You look at the guy and you go, hey, where are you going? He says, I'm running upstream to find out who the heck is throwing all these kids in the water. And that's kind of the, the thought process here of, you know, trying to, you know, the downstream thinking is I'm going to stay here all day long and just fish kids out of the river. And the upstream is I'm going to go over there and find out who the heck is throwing these people in. Um, and the other reason I like this book, and this is my own personal thing, is I think a lot of the terms we're going to talk about will resonate with people and, and you'll, you'll recognize them and they won't be necessarily totally new uh, um, thought processes to you. But what I like about Chip and Dan Heath is that they actually tell you the why. Why do we, as a, as a human race, why do we think that way? Why do our minds do that? For me personally, when I can find out the why, it helps me overcome doing things that way again, instead of just constantly saying, well, yeah, that's just the way we are, it's the way we do things. I want to hear why we do that. And you know, our goal is we're not going to be able to cover the whole book. Our goal is that many of you will pick this book up after reading this, just like Power of Moments or after going through this, this, uh, this one hour you know, meeting with us, that you'll go and you'll either uh, find it online, you'll download it, you know, uh, find some way. Uh, the book again is um, uh, it's called Upstream and it's by Dan Heath and I'll actually show it on the thing. Uh, they're actually Stanford professors. And as Matt said, they're basically, they talk about this process, but they also talk about what is causing us? What's the barriers to thinking upstream? Why don't we run upstream and find the person throwing the kids in the water? Why do we constantly fish them out? And so as Matt said, there's three major barriers. Um, and I'm gonna let Matt kind of go into depth on the first one. Yeah, so I, I mentioned them quickly, right? Problem blindness, uh, ownership and tunneling are, are, are the three reasons why I, I think we, that, that he has gone through why we have, um, difficulty in being able to think upstream. Uh, and it's really, it, it's funny, because I, I think one of the, the before I, I touch on this really quick, I had mentioned just before Daryl started talking, the immediate impact of thinking upstream often doesn't give you the rewards that you hope it does. It doesn't give this immediate impact right away. Um, but there are ways that you can start to collect data around what you're doing, or you can start putting in some degree of, of, of provisions that will let you know that it's working. And there's a really great story of, of um, and this is, as I went down the rabbit hole of, of researching this book and doing everything, uh, here, it's, it's a Van Halen story, right? Here's a deviation for this completely. So Van Halen, the David Lee Roth days, not the Sammy Hagar days, uh, the group would do these apparently just amazing pyrotechnic shows and they would be on zip lines and flying in, uh, but they would also enjoy their recreational uh, beverages and whatever else. And so when they would arrive at these venues, they were generally in an altered state and they had to rely on those venues to set everything up correctly for them. So they had these huge trucks that would go into in advance and they had to rely on these guys to set it up. And they never knew if these guys were doing it up to their standards, right? Like, and the standards were, hey, don't let me fall off this zip line in the middle of the show or don't let the fireworks hit me in the face. Like that will all be awful. So this rumor went around and this all got chalked up to them actually being a diva when more than anything, it was to get feedback on really one of their upstream thoughts, which is, Hey, let's put on great shows. Let's also recognize we're probably not the guys to be setting it up. And when we arrive at the venue, we're not in good condition to set anything up anyhow. They requested at every single show, and it would actually void their contract if this didn't happen, a bowl of M&Ms. And that bowl of M&Ms had to have every brown M&M picked out of it. There could be no brown M&Ms in there at all. 
So this sort of started to spread and people were like, oh God, what divas, why would they do this? But the belief was if the venue that they went to had taken the time to put a bowl of M&Ms out and pick every single brown M&M out, there's a pretty good idea that they were gonna make sure that the pyrotechnics were set up well and that they were gonna be safe. So they had a view of upstream thinking here and they had their safeguard for it was so tiny. It was a bowl of M&Ms, but brilliant, just brilliant. And I, I want to believe that it's David Lee Roth that thought of that, but I do not think so. <laughs> so uh, let's go to problem blindness. I think this is, uh, oh God, I mean, this is something that, that I, I end up suffering from a lot. It, it is almost a premise of, you know, negative outcomes just are what they are. Um, a really, really good example of this, and this is one of the things that he used in the book, is um, you can't solve what you can't see. And it was early 2000s or late, uh, 98, 99. Uh, sorry, I'm using a sports reference, but I swear to God it was in the book. Uh, the New England Patriots had been suffering from, for whatever reason, due to their training primarily, about 22 hamstring issues per year of their starting players. Uh, and that's a, those injuries are two weeks on the quick end and probably six weeks on the bad ones. And the understanding inside the Patriots organization was, well, it's football. People are just going to get hurt. Like this is, this is just the way it is. And this is what's going to take place. And we've just got to get used to this and understand that we've got to have a very, very deep bench of people that we can pull out. A doctor had joined the team and was going to be involved in the personal training aspects of all of the players. And he looked at the mass training that the team was doing and realized that it was really good for a small segment of people and really bad for a bunch of others. So he started to talk to people individually and started to assess their strengths, their weaknesses physically, and then started tailoring the training specifically to those players. After he was done with that, for one year of doing this, their 22 hamstring injuries a year had dropped to three. He, all he had done was come in and say, hey, look, guys, yeah, football is a violent sport. There are lots of things that can happen, but what can we prevent, right? What can we do to take the blinders off? Now, anybody in that organization could have done the same thing, but there was a belief mindset at that point that this is just the way it's going to be. And that is an incredibly dangerous way of thinking. It, it, it almost precludes any ability to go further upstream because you believe that that, that environment is what it is. Like, it's never going to change. I think one that kind of hits us more, uh, a little bit closer to home, uh, I, I think the advent of DocuSign fits into this problem blindness area for us. And, and there's a couple of reasons why. DocuSign, when it originally came out, was it was a couple of different companies that had figured out how to do digital signatures, but it had it'd come out for the legal profession, right? It was, it was one of those areas that, that they were signing tons and tons of documents, being face-to-face -face with people all the time wasn't always practical. And as long as we had people that were willing to sign digitally, boy, this could speed things up. As a realtor, and I remember that, I was sitting in a board of directors meeting and there was you know, some of the old guard that was there. I was relatively new into it. Um, and DocuSign had come up. Like we were still at the point of using MongoFax. So if any of you guys know MongoFax, you've been doing this as long as I have and we should all be ashamed. Um, but we thought MongoFax was the hippest technology ever. DocuSign comes out and I remember the discussion in the room was, our clients will never, ever go for that. They need to be face-to-face -face with us. They have got to sit across from the table. We've got to read through this. We've got to spend two hours to go through disclosures and contracts and make sure they understand everything. What happened was the slow introduction by other brokerages or people that were open-minded to this realized that there was a consumer sentiment that was like, look, I love you as an agent and I think you're great, but every once in a while when I finish work, I'm not super excited to drive to your office, meet with you for two and a half hours and go over this. I want to go over this in my own time and I'm totally fine signing this thing digitally. We now operate our business with DocuSign on everything we do. And it's gone further than that, right? We use DocuSign between parties, between friends, between, um, you know, associates. The biggest issue there was we just figured that our clients needed to be in front of us. And that was always the way it was going to be right. The problem blindness existed. We had put ourselves in a spot that our real value was sitting across from them saying, hey, let me walk you through this contract. And what we realized was the consumers actually had a need to not be right next to us all the time for these things and actually do this uh, you know, in the privacy of their own home, uh, sharing with a significant other, a family member, a parent, whatever. 
But that was one of those where we've got to be very careful as an industry because I think our industry evolves more slowly than some. We're not constantly pushed to go and solve additional issues. And I don't think anybody was raising their hand at that point going, man, if we could just make sure our clients weren't visiting us in the office, things would be great. We never said that, but now we look at it and it's made us so much more productive as agents. So the problem blindness scenario arises most often when we think the current events just are what they are. So there's a big part of this that we've got to question everything and not to the degree of being contentious, but question all the things that we're doing to make sure that the efforts we're putting in are generating the outcomes that we want. Sarah, you want to put on anything on that? Uh, yeah, just a couple things. I think, you know, trying to make it, like Matt said, making it relevant to the real estate industry. What's going on right now with this problem blindness is, I don't know that any of us realize that, and I don't know I call it a problem, but I'd say it was a hitch in the signing process. Um, and some of you will not like this statement because some of you love to do this. And, and I was one of those, which is I go to all my signings, right? I know a lot of agents who say that. I'm always there. I go to all my signings. And that's a good customer service thing. But ultimately, what we're finding is you want your title rep to get you information in a quick amount of time. And you want them to get things recorded on time. And you want the documents to look good and all this stuff. And so I think what, what this pandemic has done is made us realize you know what we can do mobile notaries we can do signings without everybody there and, and i'm going to tell you you being at the signing at least for the entire signing actually makes the signing longer and that makes the title rep spend more time in a signing and how many of times have you ever needed to get a hold of a title rep say sorry they're in a signing okay that's problem blindness i think we're slowly getting we're being forced to get through this now, for those of you who say, yeah, but it's really important that I'm there and I do this, I do think there's a, there's a customer service part to it. But I think this could change to the point of either being there for the last five minutes of it or the first five minutes of it and shortening those things up and realizing your clients, they've already seen the documents if you have a good lender, right? If they've got the loan docs. If it's a seller signing, I mean, it, it's, it's usually even easier. And I've talked to several title reps so far and they are going to be more efficient when we come out of this they've already figured it out that we're now accepting this way of doing things and you know it, it's that thought process of it is what it is that's how we do things or that's the way we've always done it and i think that's part of this you know upstream you know thought process um as matt said that's the, that's the first barrier to getting us to thinking upstream um as I go through, I want to make sure I know some of you guys are, you know, visual, visual learners here. So as we go through these, the next one is actually what we call lack of ownership. And right away, people are going to say, well, that's fairly easy. I've heard that one before. Everybody's got to own their problems. They've got to own what they did wrong. and it's, it's accountability and that kind of stuff. And I want to have you really think differently of this, this term of lack of ownership. And I think the best way is to start with what it is not okay because right away we jump to oh, i know what that is it's not accountability right it, it, it's really different than that okay it's not accountability and it's also not blame like i'm blaming you you're the one who's responsible for this you should own this that's your fault okay because those are all negative accountability comes off as negative blaming somebody comes off as negative i want you to flip it around and think of it more as this is a switch from being a victim of a circumstance to being a co-owner of that circumstance. And what does that really look like and how can we get through that? And so the empowering part of ownership is that if you think about this, if you own everything in your life, no matter what, good, bad, indifferent, you might say, well, I'm starting to not have great self-esteem because I'm now in control of every fault that I have. But at the same time, it has this incredible control because if you own it, you are the person who can control it, as opposed to that just happens to me. And one of the best ways I see this is uh, talking to agents, you know, we are going over business plans with you, we're recruiting uh, different agents. And a common question we'll say is, you know, what's your goal this year? Where are you at? And they will, you know, oh, I wanna do 8 million. I wanna do 32 deals. I wanna do 10 million. And then a follow-up question would be, okay, well, uh, what are you going to do to get there? And what are the obstacles? And 
in, inevitably you always get this comment. Well, you know, really a lot of it just depends on this spring and summer and what kind of market we hit and, you know, things are up or things are down. And you think, okay, those factors are definitely there. Those factors do come into play, but at the same time, um, if you think of it like that, if you don't take ownership, then what you're doing is it's like waking up every day, getting out of bed and then just saying, let's see what happens. Let's just see what happens today. I'm going to walk out my bedroom door and, you know, I could get hit by a car. I could do this. Like it's, there's just zero control to your life that way. When you constantly are putting others there, it's a complete and total victim mentality. So it's taken you from this. What can I do about it? I have no control aspects to this. I have complete and total control over this situation. Um, and there was a great story that they, they bring up in the book from uh it's in regards to some of you probably get this catalog in the mail, the Smith and Hawken catalog, which Smith and Hawken is like this high end garden stuff, right? Like this is not for people in the country. This is like the nicest shovels and picks. And it's, it's almost more for decoration to hang on your wall and is to actually use in your garden. Um, but the, the, the owner of, of this company, Hawken, he basically had put out this thing about environmental conservancy and how, how we were making bad carbon footprints and things like that, how we were destroying the earth. And a gentleman named Ray Anderson, who had this Anderson flooring company and carpet company, really got into it. He really saw what things were going on in the environment, but he made a decision that, that had really life-altering, business-altering uh, effects for many, many years to come, which is when he heard what Hawken was saying, he realized, oh my God, my carpet company is probably the worst violator of everything this guy is talking about. I mean, we're making our carpet out of nylon, which is you're burning fossil fuels to create more fossil fuels, right? It's like one on top of the other, and we're trucking things all over and all this stuff. And, and wherever you lie on, on the environmental you know, landscape, he took ownership of, and he basically said, okay, instead of saying, well, I've got to do it this way and it's the only tool we can use and it's the only product we can use, he brought it to his employees and he basically said, what if we were to get like a zero imprint on the earth? How could we do that? And, and the first initial response, well, we can't because uh, how are we going to recycle old carpet? Nobody recycles old carpet. And how are we going to do this? And nobody does that. And there isn't a, they, they went everything from blame game until he just said, okay, but what if, what if we were 100% responsible for this? And the way the story goes is basically years and years later, they, they had just transformed their industry. And quite honestly, they went down a little bit in profit. They, they lost, I mean, they still did well, still you know, a very wealthy man, but they didn't necessarily have the best return for their shareholders. But what they did do is they changed the way that the carpet, the carpet industry was done. And, and they left a legacy by looking at things from an ownership standpoint of I own it. And one of the best quotes that they talk about in there, and this is probably the thing, you know, how do I overcome this? You know, if I have this thing where I have lack of ownership, I am always giving control to somebody else and saying they're in charge or they're the ones who do this. And I wrote this down, it says, tell your story as if you were the only person responsible. Okay. And this is, like, I want to go to the far, like, extreme on this because it's the only way to really think about it. And it really will kind of freak you out and go, wait a second, Joe, what are you talking about? When, you, when I say tell your story as if you were the only person responsible, okay, think about a relationship, the last fight you had with your spouse, okay? And you think about that and say, I'm going to discuss this. I'm going to look at this issue I had with my spouse as if I was the only person responsible for the fight. Forget about that they did something that drove you nuts, especially because you're you know, quarantined with them for four weeks. Forget about that for a second. Look at that argument, look at that issue as if you were the only person responsible. Not blaming yourself, but if you were the only person responsible, could you control that argument from happening again? And the amazing, like all powerful thought is, oh my gosh, I can. And the far extremes of it, one, I, I've heard this story told before, and some of you are like, you know, I'm probably going to get emails saying, I can't believe you said that, Daryl. But there's a person complaining, you know, yeah, I got divorced, and this is well, how she was this way, and she was that way, and yada, yada. 
And the guy looks at me and says, well, it's your fault. Said, what do you mean it's my fault? She did X, Y, Z, all these things. He said, well, you married her. And you think about it, I'm saying, it was his choice. Many, many years ago, if you look at it from full responsibility, hey, you are the person who married her, you know, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. It's not a blame thing. And it's not stating that the other person didn't do anything wrong. It's forgetting about that because you have no control over that. You only have control over the things you do. So if you were to do that, if you just said, I own it, I'm in control of everything here, I will control those, those aspects. So I want you to think about that for number one, your clients, right? How many times, oh, it's just such a nightmare client. Stop. What do you have control over? What could happen in that in situation with your client if you were responsible for everything? You were responsible for when they got upset. It may mean, you know what, I sent an email or I made a phone call two days before to prep them on what was coming. Because if I don't, and they don't hear anything, they react a certain way. Oh, but they just react quickly. That's how they are. No, you actually have control over it. So if it's, it's with your clients, it's with your job, it's with relationships. It is really a very hard step to take this, this ownership thing. But at the same time, it's so empowering. If you look at everything as if I am fully responsible for every aspect of this problem. Anything more to add there, Matt? No, I mean, I, I think that's perfect. I mean, the only, the only things I would, I would put on there as well is the clarity of ownership. There are times where we feel we've got multiple owners of a problem. And I, I'm telling you right now, if you think you've got multiple people owning an issue, nobody owns it. That's just the way it comes down. I, look, the most candid thing I can give you guys in, in two examples is there are times where you know, my wife and I will have a conversation about something that is important and we will both walk away absolutely with a firm assumption that the other one is handling it. And then we come back a week later and go, didn't you do that? Like, I thought you were doing that. If you think that there are multiple owners in the room, you're already losing it. And I would say one of the things, I mean, my biggest, like, I mean, why this took so long, but I got to a point where when I was getting up early, uh, my wife goes to work very early in the morning. I get the kids out of bed. I get the, their lunches ready and I, I get them off to school. And it just was this chaos every morning, right? I mean, as they, they have both moved into sort of teenagers, I don't know what sort of coma-like sleep takes place, but getting them out of bed is the single hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I would complain about this all the time. I'm like, oh my God, I can't get them up. They're not moving. Why aren't you guys doing this? And I would get frustrated with them. And it was so irritating to me. And then I realized if I just got up 30 minutes earlier, did their lunch, got everything ready, had the breakfast ready, went upstairs, grabbed them, everything got easier. They started moving faster. All of the things that I had prepped for them were already done. It wasn't them being sleepy that was the issue. It was that I was cramping the amount of time that I actually had to get people going, creating a stressful environment for me and not taking ownership of the situation. I mean, I'd say the last sort of personal anecdote that I had in, in, in looking at this ownership piece is for you parents right now that are having to do any kind of homeschooling, God bless you. This is not easy. It is, it is ridiculous. But my, my oldest is, I end up, we end up getting this email from the teacher going, hey, is, is EJ, is your son, is he okay? I'm like, what? No, he's great. He's like, well, he hasn't turned in any assignments for two weeks. <laughs> oh, what? So I end up going, we have this discussion. And of course, I'm frustrated. I'm like, look, you've been going to your room. You tell me you're doing your work. I fully believe that you were doing this. What's the issue? And he's like, ah, just, it's so hard. Like, I just don't want to do it. I'm like, yeah, but you're telling me you're up there doing it. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, actually, I'm just looking at my phone. I'm like, what are you doing on your phone? He's like, well, I'm on Instagram. I'm communicating with other people. I'm doing the whole thing. So I realized that some part of this was, there was a social aspect. But when I really dug down into the ownership issue, I started looking at, Who's the guy that bought him the phone? This guy. Who's the guy that lets him have his phone in his room while he's doing homework? This guy. So ultimately, when it came down to it, I'm like, dude, I had created an environment for you that at the age of 15, I was expecting you to have a really, really large level of control of your own schedule. And that wasn't fair, right? So I was getting frustrated at something that I had actually created. So I think there's really, really hard lessons in the ownership piece but it is so cathartic and it is so freeing if you can really look at all of the decisions that you make, take some ownership of the impact that you've got in it and then make those changes from there. And it will, it's absolutely, it will happen and it will be better.
Um, sorry, there we go. That was a lot of insight into my life. Sorry. Uh, so the last one is tunneling. Um, I think I actually think that this is one of the areas, certainly as uh, realtors, that we get in the most. And really, what happens with tunneling is there is a tunnel vision that is created, and it's created when we've actually got a scarcity of a few things. It can be scarcity of money. It can be uh, scarcity of, of mental bandwidth. And what happens is we actually say things to ourselves, I can't handle this right now because I'm doing all of this. And I'll give you a small example and big example. Here we go into Matt Gord's life again. Here's a, here's a great example of tunneling. It's important decisions that you put off because they don't have now impacts. We as a family with, with two boys do not have a will. And I have been meaning to put together a will for eight years, for real. And I still have not done it because I know it's important, but it's not now, now important. And this may be the same for you. It may be life insurance that you haven't done. And there are these things that, that get into a space where it's definitely important, but it's really, really easy to put that on the back burner. And I think what happens is if you blow this out even further, I'll take two examples. One. There's a, a great example in the book of an interaction with FEMA prior to Hurricane Katrina. Um, there was one of the directors of FEMA was asked, hey, what keeps you up at night? And he's like, honestly, a massive hurricane hitting the Gulf Coast. I just don't think we're ready for that. So his forecasting of an issue that was going to happen was amazing. He had actually assembled uh, local uh, emergency crews, uh, politicians, uh, specifically in Louisiana, and he had put together a bunch of exercises, and they were going to fly down there. FEMA, the administrative group that was was in charge of how the money was spent, said, hey, look, this is going to cost $15,000 to get everybody assembled for this weekend. We don't think this is a wise use of this budget, so we're going to say no to this. Their tunnel vision on this was looking at the dollars spent and the reward given for those dollars spent. So they said, nope, we're not gonna let you do these exercises that could have all of these preventive measures in case, Katrina, in case a hurricane hit. Uh, Katrina hit and it cost FEMA $62 billion. They had said no to 15 grand because in their tunnel vision with their blinders on, that didn't fit in their budget. And then you wanna go back and ask, well, how did 62 billion fit in your budget? So make sure that when you are looking at some of the things that are preventing you from doing really important measures, even though they're not now measures, you've got to be able to have enough, enough foresight to be able to say, hey, look, this is a wise use of both my time and my energy, and I need to take care of this. Um, I think if we look right now at what we're dealing with in our environment here, um, I would say a lot of our healthcare system, and this is not a knock on our first responders that are out there at all, they're forced into downstream thinking right now. I mean, do you think when, you know, what New York is going through right now and what Italy was going through, that those ER doctors and nurses that were on the front line had enough time to sit back and go, what are some of the things that we could do to prevent this? There's no time for that, right? They are now so reactive and trying to help people and save lives in the moment. But we do know this. We know just about every political leader in the world knew that one of the biggest things that could take place was a pandemic. And we have seen varying reactions in varying countries of how they've handled this and what they're going to do. And a lot of this points to tunneling, right? The pandemic always seems like it's something that's going to happen somewhere else, right? It's not a pandemic really for, for us. It's, it's going to be an epidemic for the people over there until it happens. And then when it happens, our ability to upstream things is gone. It is now fully downstream reactive. How do we get through this? My encouragement of this, and I'll turn it over to Daryl and you can talk a little bit more about it. My encouragement for all of us is, is recognize where our blinders are. What are we blocking out? What are the issues that are in our lives that are important, but they're not life altering if we don't do them today. But if we don't do them at all, maybe tremendously life altering down the road. It is so important for us to take stock of where we're at, what we're doing, and the decisions that aren't always fun to make and start really creating a path for ourselves that alleviates the blinders that we put on every day. Daryl, anything to add on that? Yeah, uh, so, you know, for me, my personal thing here is 
um, you know, the, this thought process of tunneling and scarcity. Um, some of you are going, oh my gosh, Joe, how did you not know that already? And, um, but it really got me thinking because there's, there's a line in the book, it, it talks about this scarcity mindset, right? That when you are in scarcity, you make bad decisions and you, you make now decisions. Um, and they brought up this point that really was a shocker for me because I'll be honest, to this point in my life, if I saw somebody who was living in poverty, my, and I don't mean in third world country, I'd say like here in the US where there's opportunity, where there's the ability you know, to take control of your environment, my response would be that they are in poverty because they've made bad decisions. That's just kind of like how my mind had worked up to quite honestly reading this book. And then reading about tunneling and about scarcity, it flipped it, say, wait a second, what if instead of bad decisions made them live in poverty, what if poverty is what made them make bad decisions? And, and what I mean and what the book talks about is that if you are in that scenario, if you are in that situation and you don't have money, you're gonna make poor decisions, you're going to make now decisions instead of long-term decisions that are going to get you out of it. And it's, uh, I think one of the things they talked about, you know, was homelessness, which was, you know, we, we've got this problem everywhere, obviously in every community, but the thought process was instead of if you get clean, uh, get a job, get clothes, then if you meet all these parameters, then we can get you a home. As opposed to if we could get you a home, could you then tackle all those other issues? And, you know, there's all sorts of obviously financial implications and things like that. But I think that thought process of guys, when we put ourselves into these situations where we're in scarcity, we are going to make bad decisions every single time. And so the bigger thing about it is, okay, that's great. You've told us the problem. How do I get out of it? And Matt used to turn there. I wanted to really expand on this, this term slack. You have to have slack. And, what, what Dan Heath calls slack is even 15, 20 minutes a day, whether it's a week or whatever, it's slack time. And that slack time is that time where you actually look at what's going on in your week, in your day, uh, in your job, in your relationship, and you make a decision that's more long-term. You set that time aside and say, okay, take a breath, no more putting out fires for a second, no more just making short-term decisions, is everything I'm doing right now the right thing to do in the long term? And schedule that time. Put it in your calendar. Call it Slack Friday mornings at, at 10, whatever. Um, and, and as Matt said, if you know, we know that doctors and, and nurses and everybody on the front lines right now is just running around like crazy, but in reality, there probably is. If a leader could get in there and give them 10 minutes every morning before they start, and they're, well, there's not enough time. There is, there is 10 minutes. There's not 10 hours, but there's 10 minutes to just say, okay, stop. What are we doing right now that's causing us to run around like crazy? Well, we could make some better decisions going forward. Um, and it's you know kind of on a funny note too that he talks about this in the book, but just to prove that it's possible to do things now that have long-term implications. It's funny, as Matt said, you know, there's so many of us, I didn't set up my will, I didn't set up my trust. Um, he talks about of all the organs in our body, right? Our heart, which you can have a heart attack and our lungs and things like that. How many of you every day make a conscious decision to treat one of those major organs? I get up, I take a walk and I get my heart going or I get my lungs going or I do my exercise, I pump weights. None of, not none of us, the majority of us don't make those long-term decisions. But what's funny is of all the organs in our body that we as a society have decided to take care of, every single day is our teeth. And you go, well, what's, we brush our teeth, hopefully most of us, twice a day, morning and night, right? Some of you guys probably more, maybe some less. But it's interesting that of all the organs in our body, we have chosen our teeth to take care of, to choose slack time and make sure we're doing the right thing every single day. And so it's really think about that, like what is that decision? And, and maybe you put it around brushing your teeth. Right. That's the thing. Every morning I get up, I brush my teeth. And what's that one other thing? It's possible to create a habit that helps you in the long term. Right. 
because if you can get up every morning, brush your teeth, and then brush teeth before you go to bed every night, you obviously have it in you to make other decisions that are more long-term ones. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of wrapping this up and, and bring us to a close, you know, we said this last week, um, and uh, I want to, you know, kind of bring all this full circle every week of what's going on out there. How do we make this sort of applicable to what's happening right now? Uh, Matt brought it up at the beginning. And again, I don't want to get political. I know we've got, you know, so many sides on what's going on right now. Um, but one of the things that does come up is Matt brought up this whole, when we don't see what could have happened, that causes an issue, right? It's hard to do something. It's hard to make a decision not to run every day because I don't see that heart attack in 10 years from now, okay? And we don't know all the different things that are going to happen because of preventative measures that we're taking right now, uh, regardless of what, what department you're in. If you're in a county that should open up versus counties that are like, no, we need to shut it down anymore. It's understand that it's just not within our mindset. It's not, it's not something we do in human nature where we can look at a preventative measure and go, oh, see what didn't happen? Like that's just not natural for us. And, and that's a lot of what this upstream is about. It's tough to think upstream because you don't see immediate results or the results you see are blind. They're, you know, it's, it's the accident that didn't happen. It's the system that didn't fail. It's the customer that didn't go south. How do you prove a negative? And so, you know, my, I leave this, this, and then, and then pass it on to, to Matt is it, you know, start really looking right now, what are just a few upstream decisions I can start making every week, right? Looking at that problem, by what is, what is a problem I'm being blind to right now that I need to look at? Look at taking ownership of it and then creating some slack time in your schedule so that you don't tunnel on that problem. Uh, Matt, anything else in closing? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that was perfect. I, I would say that there's, there's one, one aspect that is, has stuck with me um, from this, because I think we have forever preached the opposite. We have always say, hey, take a macro view, right? Take a real global perspective on these. Dan Heath actually says, look, if you're going to be an upstream thinker, start with the micro first. Find the very smallest things that you want to work on. Find the very smallest issues that are coming up. Start there because it will expand. If you try to encompass like, hey, my life isn't quite where I want it to be, that's way too big that you just can't do that. But if there's a specific aspect of your life that you're like, hey, this isn't right, or this part of my business, it's just, you know, I need either more consistency in clients or I need better follow-up, whatever. Start really, really small and expand from there. Because all of what we have laid out with the problem blindness and the ownership um, tunneling, and that's just human nature, right? That's just there. That's not years and years of really bad habits that we've purposely cultivated. That's just life. That's just how we're hit with all of this. So I would say, I mean, my biggest, my biggest takeaway and, and, and my, my sincere hope for, for all of us is we're all going through, you know, this thing together. And we are in a position to be able to create a little window of opportunity and time for us that when we come out the other side, and we will. And right, new normal will be different, but things will get there again. It's to start really taking advantage of the time that we've got right now to make sure that you're doing everything that you can to be the best version of you for your family, for yourself, for your clients, for everybody that's around you by the time we finish this. So I think for both Daryl and I, I mean, our sincere hope in all of this is, is we can just help open up a different way of thinking for you that will you know, bring about a more satisfactory result for you and your life. And, and maybe it's, it'll be little changes and maybe it'll be huge changes, but we would just love for everybody to take an opportunity that has kind of been forced upon you to be really, really productive, to do things that absolutely could change the trajectory of your life. Joe, anything else to add on that? That's it. We just uh, finish up by, Hey guys, stay positive. Uh, have an awesome week. Um, Keep doing what you guys are doing. I know that there's, you know, a lot going on right now. Things are, we're, we're starting to uh, open up a little bit up here in the rural areas, but I know that it's going to be tougher on people down in the more uh, populated areas. And just ask you guys, you know, stay in this together, stick with each other. Um, we got a lot, lot more to go, but um, we will stay in touch with you. We'll let you know what next week's topic is going to be. And we appreciate you guys all being here this morning. Thanks so much. 